Romans. The first chapter. And just, just hold your position. Romans, the first chapter, and hover there. said he that seeks you shall find you. I thank you God, all that you reveal even to babes the, the secrets of the kingdom. Lord, it's this morning what we need is to listen with the heart, not with the intellect, but listen with the heart. For God, our need this morning is your ear. Oh Lord, to let the new man step forward be renewed in the knowledge of he that is created in the image of God. Oh Lord, let us this morning, let us this morning speak your words and hear with your ears. In Jesus Christ we ask it. Amen. In Amos, don't go there, I'll just tell you. In Amos, in the third chapter, in the third verse, God says, if any two are going to walk together, that they have to agree. What we need this, this today in the church is to walk with God. If we're going to do that, how many of you know that it's going to be His way, not ours? So we have to agree with Him. What I found and what the Lord expressing, the Holy Spirit expressing to me, was we of the church have done so much with salvation. The term, the definition, and none of it has been good. We must understand that if we're going to walk with God, there is an exact destination and an exact direction. That we're going to walk in. And unfortunately what's happened in the church today. Is we are more interested in movement. Than we are in direction. And destination. We'll sacrifice direction. And destination. To have movement. And movement without direction or destination. Is the definition of wandering. And that simply is what the church is doing today. We just Focus on movement. Destination is salvation. And we must understand what God's definition of salvation is. God's definition of salvation is that you would be conformed to the image of Christ Jesus. That's what it says in Romans 8, 29. It says that you are predestined and called and justified and glorified to be conformed. To the image of Christ Jesus. Now because that's destination. Then I can tell you direction. Is found in John 3 and 30. It said he must increase. But I must decrease. Now if we look at the task. Of the first church. Found in the book. In the book of Acts. We'll find that their problem. And their task. Was to convince the world. That Jesus was the Christ. Well, that's really, and I'm not talking about foreign worlds, I'm talking about the Christian world. The task in the Christian world today is not to convince the world that Jesus is the Christ. The task today is to present the true one. Jesus told us this was going to be a problem in the Gospels. He, he said, He said, Beware, deception is coming, for many are going to come. Saying that I am the Christ. Now he's not saying to you and I that there are going to be many coming that are going to pro proclaim themselves to be Christ. He's saying there are many that are going to come that are going to say that he is the Christ. But they're not going to present him as he really is. 
And that will be the deception. They will present a false Christ, a false gospel, a false spirit. In Colossians, I, I, I'm going to read there, and I know I sent you to Romans. You can stay there if you like, I, but I'm going to go to Colossians and, and, and read from the second chapter, two verses. Second chapter of Colossians 15. Let me read 14. Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross, and having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, trying, triumphing over them in it. In what? In his cross. In what he did on that cross. What I want you to see is the power of the gospel, which we're going to read about in Romans, is found in the acts, actions of Christ and the cross of Christ. This power spoiled already spoiled all principalities, triumphed over them in this action, in this cross. It's already done. So the enemy knows that this power of Christ and His cross is not overcomable by Him. So what he must do in this day and time is he must undermine that truth. And what he must do is in that undermining the truth is he must present another gospel. And he must present another Christ. He must present another cross. A counterfeit of each of these that has no power. What's happened in the church today and been happening is we have... 21st century Pharisees that have presented a golden cross in the place of the golden calf. This golden cross is the center of a system that offers salvation at a lower cost by its own definition. It can be done because what we do is we segregate a truth from the truth and make it a deception, a false cross, a false spirit, a false gospel, a false Christ. But what this does is it offers salvation apart from His image, leaving the image unchanged. And it really doesn't make any difference how I present Man, be he a deacon or a despot, a hero or a hellion, he's still a man. And he's still in the image of man. Now, in Romans 1, 16, it says, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first, also to the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God hath showed it unto them. For the invisible things of Him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even His eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because that when they knew God, they glorified Him not as God, neither were they thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into the image made like to corruptible man. Now I'm going to stop there because I'm going to tell you that this is before they made, they could not have made idols had they not first made themselves God. How can I make an idol and call it God if I've not first made myself God and have that ability to do that? So the problem is, 
They made God in the image of man themselves. Now I want you to notice in these scriptures that it said it's the power of God unto salvation. Unto salvation. I would tell you this morning in that statement that you did not get saved in 19 something. You did not get saved in 20-something. You did not get saved by an act that you performed. Not by a segregated action or a segregated truth. Salvation is a process of righteousness being revealed in you. Moving you from faith to faith. And the Word says that the just shall live by faith. That's simply saying to you and I that salvation is the process of, the, of where you are in that relationship at any given time. It's simply saying the just shall live by faith. Just simply says that, that you will obey what He's shown you. And you are being saved as you obey what He's showing you. And salvation is only as good as the last revelation. I was not saved. I am being saved. It says... Moving me from faith to faith. Understanding this. The destination of salvation is within you. It is within you. And the direction of salvation will be manifested in your life. That's where it's all going to take place. It's not something that I did. It's not something out here. It is the destination is within me. And the direction will be that which my life displays. In the 19th verse, where we were in Romans, it said, Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them. For God hath showed it unto them. What God reveals of Himself is going to be first revealed in those who live from faith to faith. Once it is revealed in you, it shall be shown to you. I come to know God because God in me. So then once it's shown to me, it will be shown through me. Now then, we see by the continued process of revelation and obedience, what takes place is a progressive revelation of God in you. That condition is salvation. And it must be continued. It must be maintained. And when we do this, it says in 1 John 3, 2, we, 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 now we are the sons of God, but it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But it says that, as he, that, that when He appears, we shall see Him as He is. Where? In you. The righteousness of God is revealed in you. That's where God will be found. And I ask God in my prayers, and have so often... I, uh, and the other day, so clearly, I said, God, you can have my life, you can have it all, but you've got to show yourself real to me. And God said, I will show myself real in you as you give me all. By continuous move, continually moving me from faith to faith, glory to glory, into the image of God. Now, what took place in Romans is it said that they rejected God. When they knew Him as God, they glorified Him not as God. And in that rejection, they then held truth in unrighteousness. The life of God is in you. 
And when I reject that revelation by, by not obeying it, what I'm actually doing is I'm holding the life of God captive to the life of man. Therefore, I'm holding His righteousness, uh, in, I'm holding His truth in unrighteousness. Do you see what I'm saying? God cannot walk the earth if He doesn't walk it in us. And if you and I are not completely submitted to God, He will not be completely presented. Now, when God was rejected by them, it changed what flows in, it changed what fills, and it changes what flows out. And it becomes, instead of God, incorruptible, uncorruptible God, it becomes the corruptible man. Now, this is the perfect picture of what we've been talking about over and over. If you want to look uh, there, you can. I'm going to go to Genesis again, and I'm going to read to you, and I want you to, to place this over Romans 1.16. In the second chapter, and in the seventh verse, it said, And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground, breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, Man become a living soul, and the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden. There he put the man whom he had formed. Out of the ground made the Lord to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight, good for food, and the tree of life also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And a river went out of Eden to water the garden, and from, from thence it was parted and became into four heads. Can you see? It's the exact picture painted by Moses... As God spoke in Romans. What it's talking about here in both of these. It says Eden flows into the garden, fills the garden, flows to the world. Romans said that the righteousness of God flows into man, fills man, flows to the world. It's the only way the righteousness of God... Now understand, the glory of God can be seen in all of creation. A beautiful flower, the air that you breathe, all of these things show you the glory, but they cannot show you righteousness. Righteousness is right standing. And there can be righteousness can, can, can only be found in that which has a choice. Man is the only thing that God can show righteousness in. It's the only thing that He can reveal Himself in. So what we're seeing then is it said the power unto salvation is flowing into man and, 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 and then outflowing, the outflow of that is salvation. That is salvation. What I just described, that's salvation. The power of God, Eden, flowing into the garden, filling that garden and flowing to the world. That is salvation. There is no other definition. And it's not about you someday dying and going to heaven and, and, and receiving the rewards and the blessings now. It's about you and I understanding that God's purpose for your life is to take your place now. That He might be presented. Salvation is a return to the original condition. It's, it's a return to man in the image of God. That's why he said, that's why he said you're predestined, you're called, you're justified, you're glorified to, to bear that image. Because that's what God intended in the beginning. Did he not say in the beginning in Genesis 1.26, let us create man in our image, in our own likeness, let us create him, he said. That's what he said. Then in Genesis, in the 131, God said that after He had created all things, He looked and He said, Behold, it's all good. Now, if God looked out on all things and He said, It's all good, Jesus said, There's none good but God. That means that when God looked upon this creation, that what He was saying was everything con contained here reflects God. Everything here manifests the glory of God. There's nothing out of harmony. There is nothing that is not governed by the divine order of God here. Everything in full communion. How was this administered? How was God's glory to be administered? Understanding that the righteousness of God can only be revealed in man. 
God said in the Psalms, in, in, in the 8th Psalm, He said, speaking of what is man that thou art mindful of him, He said, you have put him over all of the works of your hands. You put man there, He said. Why is man put over all, given dominion over all the earth? Because man is the only thing that God's righteousness can flow through. That's what the dominion is, because that's the only thing God's righteousness can flow through is man. So man is given, and through man, this, is, this then has to be administered. We must understand that to be saved is a continual, a continual flow of God maintained by the connection of Eden into the garden, into the world. We must understand that what God is doing in, in that is He is bringing a constant com, uh, uh, progression. And understand that if we are the just live by faith, it demands a constant progression in your faith. If I am truly living for God according to this word, it demands that my faith be greater today than it was last week. In Genesis 2.15 And the Lord God took the man, put him in the garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. Now I had never read those quite connected like that, but what God's saying is He said, Okay, your job is to dress and to keep God maintained the garden and commanded him to eat. They're all connected. How does he maintain? How does he guard and keep? How does he do that? By partaking. God said, this is how it's done. The only way it can be done is for you to partake. By partaking, that which you partake of will flow into you, it will fill you, and it will flow from you. That's the flow. That's why God commanded partake. He commanded man that he partake. That's what it just said. Now it also says in that, in, in that it, it says that there are two trees that are clearly identified by the consequence of their eating. Now I want you to this I want it to, to register with you. Man at that point in time may not have had any theology. Probably didn't, because he never ate of life, which would have brought him a death. He, he probably had no theology, and he had no doctrinal understanding whatsoever. But he knew the will of God in the choice that he made. That's where you are with God. It may not be, you may not have any great theology, uh, depth, or, or doctrinal truth, but you know where you are in the choices you make today. God made that very clear. They knew Him to be God when they chose not to obey. That's what the Word said in Romans, wasn't it? Now, Also, in these same two trees, the consequence of eating them was made very clear. One is life, one is death. And these trees are both in the same garden where God has just told us everything's good. In other words, it's saying everything here contained nothing but God. Everything here manifests and reflects nothing but God. So the tree's not a problem, is it? Not the tree itself. God said one of them is going to bring life, one of them is going... Now, what, what is it that was out of communion with God? It's man. Man becomes the only thing out of communion with God, and, and, and because this, he cannot stay. Revelation 21, 27 speaks of that place, that garden, that pure place. It said there will be nothing into there that's not pure. Adam becomes that which no longer reflects God, and God then must take Adam and, and remove him from that garden because he is no longer able to commune. He chose the, 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 the fall of 
man was the choice not to glorify God when he knew God. Adam's fall was not the only fall. It's not the only fall. Every time we choose to do the opposite of what we know to be God, we fall again. We fall again. When he fell, he changes the flow because Eden is now severed. And he's no longer in the image of God. But Adam's design remains the same. Adam, as far as his... God designs man in creation for a purpose, as a void, to be filled, to be the only conduit that will flow out to the world. When Adam falls, the flow changes. He selects something altogether different to flow into him and fill him, and therefore, that which he has selected is something completely contrary to God that flows from him. At this point in time, what, what we can see is this creates conditions contrary to God. This is not God's punishment. This is not God's uh, anger. This is contrary conditions that man chose. Consequences that God warns. It's death now that flows through that man as the only conduit to the world instead of life. And this creates a world that's contrary to God's creation. This creates consequences that are not in, never intended of God. And we hear people cry, how could God let this happen? When the truth is, we've just entered a realm where these consequences are truth. Essentially, what man did by his design... And being the conduit of flow, created his own environment. How different is that from you and I today? That is what the gospel tells us. You and I, by our design and creation, still create our own world. Galatians 6 and 7 said that you're going to reap what you sow. If, you're, if you sow to the flesh, you'll reap of the flesh. If you sow to the Spirit, you'll reap of the Spirit. That's not talking just about someday. That's talking about right now. If the choices of, if the revelations of God come to me, it's what I do with that revelation is going to decide the world I create for myself right now. How many of you understand what I'm saying? When I disobey God, I create a world contrary to God's intent. And I create consequences for my life contrary to God's intent. I enter into a world where a truth governs that was contrary to God's intent. Salvation is this. Salvation is the return of man to the original position and condition. It is through the sanctification of the Spirit that I would be sanctified, spirit, soul, and body. Everything brought out from under the, the, the fall. That's salvation. That's salvation. It covers all of those things. And it's not about you and I. It's about God being presented to the world in that sanctification. It's an internal voyage moving you from faith to faith. 
Now, man being the conduit of the righteousness of God, not only are we responsible for our salvation, but we are responsible for the salvation of create, the creation itself. If God can only flow around us, through us, then I'm responsible for everything around me. In the Gospel of John, in the Gospel of John, the first chapter, I'm going to read the first four verses. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. And in Him was life, and the life was the light of men. 1 John 1, 4 says, 1, 5, This is the message which we have heard of Him, and declare unto you that God is light, and in Him is no darkness at all. In the beginning, God stood alone, didn't He? There was no other presence. There was no other power. There was no other order. In the beginning, God stood there all alone. And it says that God was light, life, and light. And it says that in God, there was absolutely no death, no darkness. God stands there, and all things that were created were created by Him, for Him, and of Him. Because there's nothing else there. There's nothing but God. He did it all for Himself, from Himself. He creates all that. So, so that's, that's where we are in the beginning. And God is all in all. This is the destination and the direction of God. In 1 Corinthians 15 and 58, it said that in the end, even he that made all things subject unto him will be subject unto him, that God may be all in all. In the end, it will be as it was in the beginning. In 2 Corinthians, in the 5th chapter, in the 5th chapter of 2 Corinthians, And the 17th verse, it says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things passed away. Behold, all things become new. And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself. All things are of God. God. All in all. That is salvation. That's what it intended to be. That's what it shall be again. And what, we, what I want you to see is, as it all began... In life and light, no death, no darkness, all things were of God. Now, what happened in the fall? In the fall, everything that is adverse to life and light is created. Everything is created because there was nothing there but God in the beginning. Everything in the fall by man being a con the, the conduit that flows in the, in the fall, he himself creates the realm of darkness and the region of the shadow of death. Man created this. It was not God that created that. And it was not the devil that created it. Now understand that certainly the devil and the serpent as his agent, they were certainly death and darkness. But they had no effect on the earth until man let them in. So everything, everything that's contrary to, to let light and life was created by man in the fall. Salvation is a reversal. Of all of these things. When man rejected light and life, 
He as a void created, for God created him as a void to, to, to flow through to present himself. When man is that conduit, rejected life and light, he created a void that was filled then with death and darkness. Everything in the fall is contained within man. The entirety of that realm is contained within man. Both in you this morning and in every man is both the cause and the cure of what we see. And the only ability to change it within you today is that truth. Because the fact is, God created you to flow into you, to fill you, and to flow from you with His righteousness. And the only thing that can change that is my rejection of that flow. When man fell, because of the flow being changed and altered, and filled and out, now it's all changed. And God said to man in Genesis 3, He said, you cursed the earth. Because the blessing of life and light would have come through you to the earth. Now death and darkness is coming through you to the earth. So you have cursed the earth. Now this cursed earth, this realm, has a king. In Ephesians 6 and 12, it speaks of the, that he is the ruler of darkness. In, in Hebrews, uh, the second chapter and the 14th verse, it said that he, the devil, has the power over death. He has the power over death, and he is the ruler of darkness. But he's only has that power in that darkness. He only, he only has the power of death in that region created by man's choice. Jesus said in John 14, I think the 30th verse, Jesus said, the prince of this world cometh, but he has nothing in me. Oh, what Adam did in his rejection is he gave Satan a place to operate. And in that place, he is the ruler. In that place, he is a power. But only in that place. 2 Corinthians 4 and 4 said that He's the God of this world. He is the God of this world because He's the God of the nature Adam chose. It's all within you. Do you not understand that, that death and darkness is within the nature Adam chose just like light and life is in the nature he rejected. So then I can bring light and life into death and darkness just by letting God in. And that's the only way. We can walk out of this. Simply by every revelation of God becomes my commitment to obey. Death and darkness are not powers. They have no power except in that, that world Adam created in the fall. They have no power except in the world he chose to enter by rejection of life and light. It's the only place. Because they are not powers. God is power. Death 
and darkness did not overcome man. Death and darkness did not overcome creation. Man rejected power and death and darkness filled the space. And created all the consequences that we see today that we blame God for. This is the truth that we must understand in our own life. We create an environment. Brothers and sisters, we move from faith to faith, and that works in the other direction too. You create an environment in your life that will either be able to believe God or will, will not be able to believe God. The just shall live by faith. If I am not obedient to God in the last revelation, I cannot have faith. I cannot believe God because only in my obedience to God do I come into the ability to believe God. Within you is cause and cure. We can walk out. Understanding that, again, you were not saved by some act. You were not saved at some past date. You are being saved. You were born again, maybe, on some certain past date. But that's the first step of salvation. Not salvation. Not salvation itself. We've, we've completely come off center. When I am born again, a new creature is quickened by the Spirit of God within me. That new creature is born out of its environment just as surely as a fish is born out of water. And the first thing that new creature does is it said, I've got to get back to where I came from. I'm, I'm, I've got to get back to God. That sanctification of the Spirit. Then that sanctified Spirit begins to speak to us by revelations of God. And as those revelations of God are obeyed, then that Spirit will begin to return. And every time it moves, new things, old things become new. Old things pass away and the environment around me is changed. And I can believe God today more than I could believe Him yesterday because I've moved from my faith which is failing to His faith which cannot fail. And it's as simple as knowing that when God says don't, I won't. Hallelujah. I want you to see today that salvation is not what we've made it. It's not something that's going to happen one day and affect us someday. Salvation is taking our place right now that God can operate. And I want you to see that you are in that garden just as surely as Adam was. Right now. You have an unction an anointing from the Holy One and you know all things. I have not written unto you because you know not the truth, but because you know it and that no lie is of the truth. What is a liar but he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ? He is the Antichrist that denied the Father and the Son. Whosoever denieth the Son, the same hath not the Father. But the anointing which you have received of Him abideth in you, and you need not that any man teach you, but as the same anointed teacheth you of all things, and is truth, and is no lie, even as it hath taught you. You shall abide in Him. What's it saying? 
It's saying the same thing God told Adam. You may not be deep theologically. You may have absolutely no doctrinal basis. You may be, you may be a babe, or you may be very deep. In, it doesn't matter. But the one thing that does matter is God is saying, you know the truth in the things that you choose right now. You know the truth. And to abide in Him is to obey that truth. And the choice is indeed life or death. For he that chooses accepts Christ as Christ. And he that denies refuses to obey Him as God when you knew that to be God. And we change the image, making ourself God, into the change. Our God becomes the image of corruptible man. This is what it's talking about. And in this, within you, is either the consequences of life or death. He said, if you that which abides in you, you must abide in Him. Hallelujah. And then the last thing it says. And now little children, abide in him, that when he shall appear, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. It says that he shall appear, and that we shall not be ashamed at his coming. It's two different events. Two different events. If he doesn't appear... You will be ashamed at His coming. Where does He appear? In you. In you. Praise God. Praise God. It's so simple. Just do what you know to do. And God will take care of the rest. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Church, we are, we are on a place, I believe with all of my heart, God is saying, I must first create the clean place. And everything will pour forth from that place. And nothing can happen until that place is created. And that's what he's doing right here. In your heart. In my heart. In this place. And we look at it, I look at it, and I say... Lord, there's so much that I, that I should be doing. There's so much that I see that needs to be done. And God is saying to me, I am creating the clean place. And the fire will burn from that bush. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you, God, for its simplicity. And I thank you, God, that it remains simple because its depths are brought forth as we are given a mind to receive them. And I pray this morning in my life Oh God, just use me. Create in me what you need. That every purpose that you have called would come forth. And not one God would be left. Not one would fail to take place. 
Let me be God. So yield it to you. And as you flow into me, I will be capable of this submission. Amen. 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 God must break us. He must break us. He just must break us to the point that we come and understand and truly understand there is none good but God.